Welcome to worship here this morning at Holy Trinity Church. It's a great a delight for me to be back again after such a long time. Um, as we gather, we are conscious that we live and work and worship on the lands of the indigenous peoples, the First Nations of this land, the uh, Turrbal and Yagara people in the case of Brisbane. I also bring you greetings from the uh, Anglican Church in Jerusalem, from the congregation at St. George's Cathedral, and, um, and we pray especially for them at this very moment as uh, missiles are raining down upon Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and probably other centres around the country as well. So as the tragedy of Palestine and Gaza unravels, we pray for uh, generous hearts, calm minds, and a passion for justice and reconciliation. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed, Blessed be God's be kingdom, kingdom, now and forever. Christ is risen, alleluia. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, our desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been offered for us. Therefore, we come to celebrate the festival. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith with a sincere and a true heart. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us, love, and obey you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you your sins, and keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. We beseech you, O Lord, pour your grace into our hearts, that as we have known the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, by the message of an angel, so by his cross and passion we may be brought to the glory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Again the Lord spoke to Azar, asking, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Shehol, or high as in heaven. But Azar said, I will not ask. 
and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary me, my God, also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. Hear the word of the Lord. A portion of Psalm 40, saying alternate verses after me. O Lord my God, great are the wonderful things which you have done, and your thoughts which are towards us. There is none to be compared with you. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but my ears you have marked for obedience. In the scroll of the book it is written of me that I should do your will. O oh my God, I long to do it. Your law delights my heart. I have not hidden your righteousness in my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and of your salvation. I have not kept you your loving kindness and your truth. Your great A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, See, God, I have come to do your will, O God. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, See, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hear the word of the Lord.
Lord be with you. And also with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May these words be spoken and heard in the power of love. Amen. I was going to say, please be seated, but I hadn't looked up. You already were, so there you go. You knew what was coming next. The Feast of the Annunciation, the principal Marian festival, and one which has survived in the affections of the Anglican Communion. Lady Day, as we call it, which... This year has been celebrated over and over again on different weeks as mothers' union groups and parishes and cathedrals move um, the date of the celebration um, away from the Monday, I think it was, in Holy Week to the next available significant Sunday. On this day, we celebrate Mary both in scripture and tradition. And as we're doing that, I'm, re I'm reminding myself, but also now sharing with you, something that Father Ted will be familiar with, because one of the key principles of hermeneutics or biblical interpretation that I seek to inculcate in my students at the seminary is the idea that we do not mortgage truth to historicity. A story can have profound truth value, whether or not it's a story about something that actually happened. 
So let's not, let's not be too concerned about that. Let's just focus on what this feast, what this festival invites us to engage with. It's a particular weakness of the Western mindset ever since the Enlightenment to worry about historicity. But it doesn't serve us well when we're seeking spiritual wisdom for everyday life as we are in this liturgy, as we are indeed every time when we gather at the table of Jesus. Of course, we'd like to know what really happened, and as a historian, I'd especially really like to know what happened. But when it comes to the past, we can rarely do that. However, what we do need actually to know, as distinct from wish we could know, is how to live now in ways that are holy and true. And by true, I mean authentic. Our shared memory of Mary, the mother of our Lord, is grounded in scripture. But on closer examination, it has actually a very narrow base within the sacred text. And that perhaps will take us a little bit by surprise. If we go to the earliest of the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark, there's just a single episode where Mary and the siblings of Jesus feature as participants in the story. It's a paragraph towards the end of Mark chapter 3. Jesus is down at Capernaum, which is, I guess it's about, let me think, it's probably about 30 k's, 35 k's from Nazareth, um, although the roads are a bit better these days than they were then. Jesus is busy. He's in the house where he's tended to stay, probably the house of Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And there's a crowd outside, and somebody comes in to say, excuse me, Jesus, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are here. And they'd come to take him home. They thought he needed a bex and a lie down. He was getting a little bit over serious with this kingdom of God stuff. And he was stirring up quite a lot of interest. And people who stir up interest and attract attention by the political powers don't live very long. So they've come to take him home for a little bit of R&R. And that story also recurs in Matthew and in Luke. If you like, it's the, it's the, it's the regular default story about Mary and the immediate family of Jesus across the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's it. That's the only story where Mary figures in the Gospel of Mark as a character in the story. Gospel of Matthew comes along, and maybe 25 or 30 years later, we don't know exactly when these books were written, and Matthew is basically the new, revised, and enlarged edition of the much-loved Gospel of Mark. That's what the publisher would have put on the front cover if there'd been a chance to do that. And Matthew, as I've mentioned, preserves that same incident from Mark chapter 3, but Matthew famously adds the Bethlehem birth narratives, you know, the ones where Joseph is the key character, where God communicates with Joseph by dreams, just like that other Joseph guy in the Old Testament, okay? Where the wise men turn up, where Herod plays the part of Pharaoh 2.0 and ends up killing or ordering the death of all the baby boys in the area around Bethlehem, reminiscent of the slaughter of the Hebrew children, Hebrew boys in the book of Exodus. And Mary's obviously there because partway through the story, Jesus gets born. But we're never told that he's born. There's no, there's no reference to the fact that Jesus is born. And Mary is simply, quote, the mother of the child. Fascinating. Okay. It's all about Joseph, is the way Matthew tells the story. Because Matthew is writing for a community of Jewish Christians, possibly up around the, the city of Antioch, which these days is part of Turkia, was devastated by the earthquakes about this time last year. And he's, he's, he's wanting them to understand that this Jesus Christ character 
for them is like Moses 2.0. Moses all over again. And that it's, there's no profound conflict between being a follower of Jesus and a faithful servant of Torah. So Mary barely gets a look in even when her baby boy is born as part of the story. We skip forward to the Gospel of John, probably somewhere around the end of the first century. Again, we don't know for sure. We actually find two stories, different stories from the one we had from Mark and Matthew and Luke, two stories where Mary is, the, is a key character. But John never says her name. It's always something like, and the mother of Jesus was there. Okay, And his mother said to him, they've run out of wine, which is a good thing for mum to point out when there's a big party going on. Hey, son, the wine's running low. So it's simply the mother of Jesus. And famously here, and also at the crucifixion scene where John alone, of all the Gospels, has Mary at the foot of the cross, Jesus only refers to his mother as woman woman what's that to do with me woman behold your son son behold your mother so john's gospel has a, a, an, an interest in mary and imagines mary being with jesus from the very first action in his ministry the miracle at cana to the very last moment of his life as he's dying on the cross Mary is there, but never named, simply the mother of Jesus. And this is the same gospel who, surprisingly, to our ears that are attuned to the Christmas story, in John chapter 6, the crowd say, um, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I've come down from heaven? So John is even willing to name Joseph, but Mary never gets her name in the Gospel of John. So the biblical tradition is a little bit different than what we perhaps imagine it to be. And then we come to the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, which I'm doing last, mentioning last, because I actually think Luke is the last of the Gospels. And when he says in the beginning of chapter 1, Many other people have tried to write an account. He's including Matthew, Mark, and John. And he's, he's wishing to offer uh, an account which improves and updates and indeed displaces the earlier accounts, at least for his patron, Theophilus, for whom he's written his book. So almost everything we think we know about Mary actually comes from the Gospel of Luke which I find fascinating. Luke, the Gospel of Luke and the, book and the Acts of the Apostles are also where we get the church year from, the liturgical year. It's why we have 50 days between Easter and Pentecost and so on, because of the way Luke tells the story. And as of course, the Gospel of Luke is where we find the beautiful anthems, uh, the Benedictus, the Ninth Dimittis, and the Magnificat. Luke has shaped our spiritual imagination in so many ways and in particular Luke has shaped the way we imagine Mary. In the first two chapters of his gospel he provides us with a beautiful infancy narrative for Jesus but it's not simply a birth story for Jesus because it's intertwined with the birth story of John who we know better as John the Baptist where Matthew, as I mentioned earlier, wanted to portray Jesus as a second Moses, Luke wanted to present Jesus as the child chosen by God to be the saviour and the ruler of the world. Luke was writing for a Roman audience, or at least for an audience that was familiar with the sacred legends of Rome, and particularly the legends of Romulus and Remus. So Luke tells us this fascinating story of two boys, no longer brothers as they were in Romulus and Remus, but two boys 
cousins, at least in Luke's gospel, one of whom is destined to be the ruler, the saviour. And that's where we get our, from those two first two chapters of Luke, that's where we get our picture of Mary. Around it we've wrapped other legends. Like me, you probably imagine the Annunciation happening at the well, but there's no well in the Gospel of Luke. Okay, That's in a second century, the infancy Gospel of James, we find Mary is at the well. But to this day, in every Palestinian village through the whole of Israel and Palestine, if there's a well in the village which has water all year and never runs dry, even if everybody in the village is Muslim, that well is called Mary's well. Okay? Fascinating. So Mary has a, has a, a story which, of course, is bigger and larger and, and more interfaith than simply the story we get from the Gospel of Luke. And if you go pouring your way through all the rest of the New Testament, the letters of Paul and the other letters and the book of Revelation, not a reference to Mary anywhere. So basically, it's Luke. And for that, we give thanks for Luke's beautiful artistry as well. Unlike Matthew, when he tells the story, Luke was interested in Mary, and he presents Mary in very positive terms, while in Luke's account, Joseph fades into the background. He's there, you know, a virgin in the town of Nazareth as a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph. But Joseph plays no significant role in the birth story of Jesus in the way Luke tells the story. Mary is an active participant in the story as Luke tells it. Angel Gabriel comes to Mary. It's not an angel comes to Joseph in a dream. The angel comes to Mary. Mary responds as a woman of humility and grace, but also courage. We'd almost say guts. In a little village of about 250 or 300 people, to be pregnant while not married is not going to be something you keep secret. It's going to be a difficult gig for Mary. But Mary says yes. Mary doesn't seek publicity, and in the story that Luke tells, nowhere else in the New Testament, Mary goes off to spend time with her cousin Elizabeth, who will soon become the mother of John the Baptist. So you can see Luke winding these two stories together. Indeed, as Luke tells the story, when Mary arrives, little unborn John the Baptist does a triple backflip or something like that in honour of the fact that the Messiah has just arrived, albeit a very, very tiny version of the Messiah at that point. It's Luke who writes for Mary this beautiful song which we call the Magnificat, an amazing prophetic song which Luke has based on the similar song of Hannah in the first book of Samuel, but has crafted it and polished it so it becomes an amazing prophetic call for people of all generations, not only to call Mary blessed, but also to cast down the mighty from their thrones and to feed the hungry and the thirsty. Mary comes through in the story Luke tells as a religiously observant Jewish mother. She takes herself and her newborn child to the temple to do the rituals required for both of them in the Jewish religious tradition. She's a woman of faith. Indeed, as the story goes on, and even in the other bits of the Gospels, as we hear some of the names for Jesus' siblings, mind you, we've never told the girls' names, just that he had more than one sister. So sister is plural, but they're not named. Um, but as we're told the names of, of the brothers of Jesus, Mary's other children, we have James, we have Joseph, we have Simeon, we have Jude. In other words, these are the names of the 12 sons of Jacob. 
So Mary and Joseph have a household which not only goes to the cathedral on the big days, the temple, of course, in Jerusalem, but in their own family practice, their children are named and presumably are, 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 are shaped by the great traditions of ancient Israel. Mary is still an anxious parent when they're on their way back home some years later and the 12-year-old Jesus has stayed behind in Jerusalem, exploring the temple, getting into conversation with the religious leaders. And she's anxious and rebukes him. Didn't you know that your father and I were worried about you? What are you doing, boy? I added the last bit. Okay. So we can see a, a pretty a standard, um, concerned, passionate mother, even as the boy is beginning to be old enough to make his own decisions. Perhaps the bit I love best is that Mary is reflective. Stuff happens, but as it happens, in the way Luke tells the story, at various points, Mary keeps these things in her heart. Mary ponders these things. Okay? She's not simply going through life. She's joining the dots. She's reflecting. She's seeing where God is at work. And finally, in the way Luke tells the story, perhaps with an idea that he borrowed from John, in Luke's gospel, Mary is at the cross, which is a tragic end to the promise made by the angel. And in Luke's gospel, Mary is there with Mary Magdalene and a couple of other women as they come to the tomb on Easter morning. Okay. During this week, um, I, had a, I needed to speak with a dear friend of mine whose son, who's also a Catholic priest, so James will probably know who I'm talking about, but whose son died tragically during this past week. Um, no mother wants to go to her son's funeral. No mother wants to be involved um, in, the, in the death rituals for their child. But that was part of Mary's calling as well. So that's the biblical portrait of Mary. And in particular, it's a portrait sketched by Luke. So it's perhaps no surprise that in the early tradition of the church, Luke is also seen as the person who painted the first icon and in particular, the first icon of Mary. Perhaps there is a truth there, but it's not actually an icon. Most likely, Luke never met the Blessed Virgin Mary. But Luke certainly offers us the first and the most powerful sketch of what the mother of Jesus was like. So we can ask ourselves, so what's the ratio between Luke's imagination and historical detail? Was Mary really like that? The answer, of course, is we have no idea. We have no idea. But we can choose to spend time rather on those questions and wasting our point. We can choose to spend time on the opportunity today gives us to say, how do we imagine Mary? What sort of image of Mary do we have? Okay. In what way is she a role model for us? Where is the spiritual wisdom for us as we face the challenges that we have to face? And were my friend with me today, whose son's funeral I'll be going to later in the week, perhaps I'd be saying to her, what strength do you find as a mother whose son has died knowing that Mary stood at the foot of the cross? and then came back a couple of days later to finish the burial arrangements. You see, God doesn't just send Gabriel to Mary. The Annunciation is not a once-off event that happened in Nazareth 2,000 years ago. Rather, it's a process that recurs across time and in every place and indeed in every human heart. God comes to each of us and seeks us to engage us in the divine mission to which Mary was invited to contribute. That's the mission 
to transform creation and to bring the kingdom or the rule of God into our lives, into our villages, into our workplaces, and even into our churches where so often the kingdom of God seems missing. In the character of Mary, Luke offers us a template for how we might offer a humble yes to God's amazing invitation. Like Mary, we can be God bearers. May her prayers assist us to say yes to God and also to be people who ponder these things in our heart. Amen. As we're able, let's please stand as we join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So let's pray for the church and for the world. The response to Lord hear us is Lord graciously hear us. Lord hear us. Lord of grace hear us. At the Annunciation, the Father made our salvation known to by Mary by the message of an angel. Filled with confidence, let us pray. You chose the Virgin Mary to be the mother of your son. Have mercy on all who wait for your redemption. We pray for the church universal. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Through your angel, Gabriel, you brought a message of peace and joy to Mary. Give to the world the joy and the peace of salvation. We pray for peace in Palestine and Israel and an end to the brutality there. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. By the consent of your handmaid and the power of the Holy Spirit, your word came to dwell among us. Open our hearts to receive Christ as, ver as Mary the Virgin received him. We pray for all here present, gathered around your altar in praise and adoration. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. You look with compassion on the lowly and fill the hungry with good things. Encourage the downhearted, help all those in need and comfort those near death. We, we pray for Jen, Jenny Clark, Roy Gorman, Rod Hardiker, Father Shane Hubner, Liz Jarvis, Robert Normoyle, Judy Henderson Place, Father Stephen Redhead, Father Colin Roberts, Jill Sharwood, Sandra Spring, Elspeth Sutherland, and Robert Thisfield. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. To you, O oh God, nothing is impossible, and you alone do marvelous things. Save us and bring us on our last day with Mary Grimshaw and Francis Clark and all the faithful departed into your glorious kingdom. Amen. As we pray for the faithful departed, we remember especially Dorothy Bunsley, Caria Marie Pallister, 
Nicholas Peter Wood, Colin Victor Doggett, Elsie Linda Lynn, Christine Beatrice James, Sarah Wapal, Donald McDonald Fitzsimons, Percy John Foster, Robert McGregor Exton, and Leslie Turner. Grant, O Lord, that by the riches of your grace, we may grow up into him who unites our life to yours, even he who is the firstborn of all creation, your Son, Jesus Christ. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith, we may by your grace receive, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand as we're able for the greeting of peace. Christ is risen, alleluia. He is risen indeed, alleluia. In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high shall break upon us to give light to those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Alleluia. The peace of the risen Christ be always with you. And also with you. Please offer each other a sign of Christ's peace. God's peace. God's peace.
Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we, we have this... Sorry, I'm going to change the words. We have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. glory and honor be yours oh <clears throat> let's start that again oh glory and honor be yours always and everywhere mighty creator ever living god we give you thanks and praise for your son our savior jesus christ who was born and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. And now we give you thanks for the obedience of your servant Mary, who by your grace answered the call to be the mother of your son. With all generations we call her blessed, and with her we rejoice in the great in the greatness of your salvation. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you, and singing. Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine, and we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
After supper, he took the cup. Again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. And we look for his coming again. And looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. In faith we acclaim you, O Christ. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. We break this bread, bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body. We all share this one bread. The gifts of God for the people of God, holy things for holy people, broken things for broken people. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Alleluia. Let us keep the feast.
Let us pray. God, our Saviour, your word proclaims our salvation, which we taste in the bread of life. Grant us the humble obedience we see in Mary, that we too may respond as willing servants and bear your word to our world. Sorry, wrong page. Living God, make us apostles of the risen Christ. Give us joyful hearts, words of hope, and grace to recognize the Lord Jesus when he meets us, wherever we are on the road. It's you, I presume. If it's me, there are no notices. But I don't think you're getting off quite that easy. Greg, would you like to come out the front? Again, we did this last I'll time. I'll be really quickly. <laughs> um, thank you, friends, um, for joining us with worship this morning. As you probably realise, Father Rodney um, is on leave, and we are very, very grateful to Father Greg for coming back to his, one of his home parishes to be with us. Um, I'm going to give him some bickies now as thank you. Oh, thank um, we've you. set the standard now, so every time he comes, we've got to give him something sweet for the trip home. Um, and I'd like to invite you to join with me as we just pray quickly for Greg before we finish the service. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for blessing us with people everywhere in our lives. We thank you for blessing us with Father Greg. We pray you continue to bless him and his family on his journey towards your loving embrace. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Back thank to you. you. Thank you. There's still no notices. Like there's nothing happening here. Nothing to see here. It's All Holy the notices Trinity. are in your pew sheet. Ah, um, they're in there. Okay. If you want something specific, my phone number is in there as well. Okay, I'll yeah. give you a ring. So we might do the missional hymn. Yeah. <laughs> Christ, the Son of God, 
born of Mary, gladden our hearts by his coming to dwell among us and fill you with joy and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. The angel of the Lord declared to Mary, and she conceived of the Holy Spirit. Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Now Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia, Alleluia.